Continuing in 50 Days of Transformation, we've been looking at spiritual health, physical health, mental health, emotional health. Last week, a relational health. And uh, this week, we're looking at financial health. Obviously, finances are a part of life, a part of what we do. can cause us stress, can cause us to worry, can cause a lot of different things. So it's uh, something that we're going to be addressing not only today uh, and this weekend, but also in our small groups you know, it's interesting, if you look in Scripture, you find that Jesus talked a lot about money, that you find that, uh, that Jesus talked more about money and money management than he did about heaven and hell. If you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you find that one out of six verses talks about money or money management. Why? Well, obviously, because it can dominate our life. It influences our life. It influences others for good or for bad, of course. Now, the verse we're going to look at, if you have your Bibles, turn to uh, or open your app to uh, Luke 16. And it's really an interesting story, often a very misunderstood story about, about uh, uh, what Jesus seems to be approving. There's a dishonest manager here and Jesus uh, commends him. So, some people walk away thinking, well, Jesus is wanting me to be dishonest. That is not what he's wanting. And so we're going to just look at that a little bit. He's actually the, the, the dishonest manager. He's, he's also a very shrewd manager. That is what he is commending. He's saying that's a good thing. Shrewd meaning he's strategic. He's thoughtful. He's anticipating uh, needs that would come. And, and those are the things that he's, that he's doing. So he uses this kind of as Jesus often does for shock value, uh, keep people awake, they're paying attention, what's going on here? And then they really kind of dial in and then there's a message that comes across. So I'm going to read it. Uh, if you don't have uh, easy access to uh, a Bible app, it'll be on the side screens and then we'll talk about it, okay? Jesus said, there once was a rich man who enlisted a manager to take care of his property. But the manager was accused of wasting his master's possessions. So the owner called him in and said, you must now give me an account of your stewardship and report what you've done with what I've entrusted you because your time as a manager is ending. The manager thought, what am I going to do now? I'm losing my job, but I'm not strong enough to dig ditches and I'm too proud to beg. I know what I'll do so that after I lose my job, I'll have plenty of friends to take care of me. So he called in everybody who was in debt to his master. He asked the first man, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager said, okay. And, uh, he, and, he, and he, uh, he tears up the bill and writes a new bill and says, okay, you only owe 400 gallons. Obviously, he's doing this under the table. Next, the manager found another debtor and asked, how much do you owe? The guy said, oh, 1,000 bushels of wheat. The manager says, okay, uh, I'll take your bill and you'll only owe 800. Um, uh, and so he's obviously doing this without the manager's permission even. Now when the master or the owner heard what the dishonest manager had done, he still praised his shrewdness. For worldly people are more shrewd in handling their affairs than are those who belong to the light. It's kind of a strange story, right? He's saying, you know, Jesus is using an example about a guy who's doing underhanded things, and he's saying, 
Hey, that's a good thing. Again, it's not the dishonesty, but the shrewdness. He says, use your, and then in verse 9, Jesus says, use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves. Again, an interesting statement. So that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwelling. He's talking about heaven there. Whoever can be trusted with, with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever's dishonest with little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, in other words, you're not a good money manager, you're not taking care of the, the, the possessions and the money and the things that God's given you here. He says, who's going to trust you with true riches? He's talking about spiritual riches. And if you have not been trustworthy with somebody else's property, who's going to give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other or will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So he, he doesn't say you shouldn't serve God and money. He says you can't. It's impossible. You have to choose because they're often competing values. What the, the whole idea of what money buys and what the world sees as money and then what, what God says is really important. And he says that often those are pitted at each other. He says you have to decide. You have to make a fundamental decision. So, so, and he says, and he uses this uh, story to, uh, to illustrate that. He says, you can learn from, uh, from this guy. Now, sometimes people think, well, I can only learn from somebody I totally agree with, somebody who's got complete integrity, but that's not really true, right? I mean, I mean we learn from people that don't, under, that don't completely agree with us. Just If you're married, ask your spouse, you know? I mean, you can learn from them and they don't completely agree with you or your kids, or, uh, you know, a whole bunch of other people, your friends. If, if you have a, if you, have, if you need surgery, and you go to a surgeon, you know, if you, like, if somebody's got a brain tumor, they go to a surgeon. The, my first question is not, did you do your Bible study this morning? If I'm talking to the surgeon, I'm not going to ask him, did you go to church this week? I'm not even going to ask him if he's a Christian. What I'm going to ask him is, is, have you done this before, right? How did it, how did it go? You know, I'm, those are the things I'm interested in. So we can learn from people that don't necessarily agree with us or we don't agree with them. They don't even have the same values. And this is kind of what's going on here. This guy uh, had some, some, some unscrupulous way of doing business. But Jesus says, even somebody like this, you can learn from him. Now, I think there's a couple of reasons why Jesus gives a story like this. One of them is he's talking to the Pharisees. And if you know anything about the Pharisees, the Pharisees are uh, the religious leaders of the day. They're, they're arrogant. They're prideful. Uh, they don't care about people. But most of all, they're hypocrites. They don't even do what they teach people. They, 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 they say, you know, you should believe this. And then they themselves are not doing it. And so Jesus often would... Uh, go around and he would challenge the Pharisees. He would poke them in the eye. He'd, you know, he'd, he'd stir up trouble because he'd kind of rile them up because he didn't like the way that they were, they, were, they were teaching people and they were going about doing things. So, and, and one of the things about Pharisees is they loved money. That's why Jesus tells this, this shocking story about the, this crook who's the hero. Notice it says, um, from, uh, this is out of the rest of, of, of that chapter. He says, the Pharisees dearly loved money so when they heard what Jesus said, they made fun of him. But Jesus told them, you're always making yourselves look good, but God sees what's in your heart. The things that most people think are important are worthless as far as God is concerned. And so that's true today. What most people think are important, whether it's possessions or pleasure or power or money, salary, position, all those things, he says, those aren't important. What's really important are things that outlast that. And so one of the things that we're hoping uh, to do through this series, and of course tonight, is, is when we read uh, what Jesus is saying, allowing the Holy Spirit to transform us. You know, our theme verse, which is, do not be conform conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so we're wanting, uh, there's a pattern that the world has. We don't want to be conformed to that. We want to let the Holy Spirit change the way we think, change the way we view, and in particular, change the way we think about money. I think a second reason Jesus tells a story uh, about, uh, about this, about this money managers, many of us are poor money managers. Many of us don't 
save well. We don't retire, you know, plan for retirement. We don't have good investments. We don't give well. We're, many of us are living, you know, just hand to mouth or we're not really thinking through how we're spending our money and, and using it and being good money managers. And so he says, that's, that's actually an important part of life and how you, how, that's kind of a test and how you use your money, how you spend it, all those things, are, they're important. And so this guy here, he's resourceful. He's strategic. He's thinking through things. And he says, you can learn from this guy. So let's look at this story kind of a little bit more in detail. And four things, first of all, that are, we, we are, we're not to do. We'll do this quick, and then we'll look at uh, five things that we, that we can really uh, use every day in our life. Number one is just don't waste it. So in Luke 16, 2, it says, the manager was accused of wasting his master's possessions. And so we recognize that it's, it's God's money. That's, so we don't want to waste God's money. It's one thing if we're just wasting our own money. But when we realize this is God's money, we don't want to do that. He says, don't waste it. Number two, it says, don't love it. The Bible says that um, we're not to love money. Now in verse 13, it says, no servant can serve two masters who either hate one or love the other or be devoted to one or despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So circle it. You cannot. You, it's just impossible. You, you, when you, you have divided allegiance, so you may have to make a fundamental decision. What's going to be most important in my life? If you drew a little box and you had to put one thing in it, a cross or a little money figure, you, you can't, but both can't go in there. It says you have to make a fundamental decision. What's number one in your life? Number three, don't trust it. You don't waste it. You don't love it. You don't trust it for security. It has its limitations. And so this manager learned this pretty quick. Verse three says, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm losing my job. When you put your security in money or what things money buys, you can lose that. It's true with a lot of things. You can, if you're putting your security in your apparent, in your appearance or how you look, uh, it's, just to let you know, some of you, you're not gonna look as sexy as you are today forever, okay? <laughs> I mean, that, that goes that goes down, right? If you put your security in your health and all, you can lose your health, right? You, you put your security in your job, you can lose your job. You put your security in, in your marriage, you can lose that. You can end up divorced. You put your security, or, or they could end. You put your security in a loved one. That, that could end for some, you know, they could die or something could happen. So there's only one thing that's truly secure and it's God's love for us. So that's important that we root our identity and our security in the right thing. It's, it's not that we don't manage those other things well. Where is our security coming out of? And it comes out of recognizing God loves you. Proverbs 23, 5 says, Your money can be gone in a flash as if it has grown wings and flown away like an eagle. Right? Steve Miller, Steve Miller sings a song like that, right? <laughs> Fly like an eagle. Right? And in fact, there's, there's, uh, the U.S. government has put uh, an eagle on our, on our money to kind of remind us. It'll be gone soon, right? Every time you look at it, this, is gonna, this will be gone. Number four, don't expect it to satisfy. Sometimes people think that. They think, oh, if I only won the lottery, then I would be happy. You know, then all my problems would be, would be gone. But we know too many stories about people that they get they, they just story after story about the stress that it caused and breaks up their marriages. They, they, they weren't good money managers before they won the lottery. And so when, when, when we think that that's going to satisfy, that somehow I'll have more value if I have more money. But that's just not, that's not true. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, whoever loves money will never have enough. And whoever loves wealth will never be satisfied with his income. They always want more. Somebody asked Howard Hughes, how much does it take to make a man happy? He said, just a little bit more, you know. And that's a guy who had a lot. Luke 12 says, guard against all kinds of greed because your life is not measured by how much you own. And so our value comes because Christ died for us, because the Holy Spirit lives in us. That's where our value, that God wants to use us, and he made us for a purpose. That's where our value comes from, not by how much money we make or how much money we we own. So those are things we don't want to do. Now let's look at some things that really are revolutionary. They're counterculture on how we approach money. Number one is, is what to remember every day. I remember that it all belongs to God. 
So that's the first thing as a Christ follower, as we, as we put our faith in Christ and we, and we, and we look at the, the Holy Scriptures, we realize early on that God made everything out of nothing and he created it all. And so the whole universe, the stars, the planet, the trees, the things we, that, that, you know, are everything we have. God is the source of it. You see, yeah, but I, I earned that. I, I, I made money and that's how I bought my car. Yeah, but who gave you the ability to earn? He said, well, I worked with my two hands. Who gave you your two hands? So we recognize, you know, that God, uh, he's the one who made it all. And he gives it as a loan. So it, it's, it's loaned to us for, you know, 80 years or whatever, plus or minus some years or a decade or two. And before, before you were born, somebody else had that stuff. After you die, somebody else will have it. Well, it's on loan for us. And so we recognize that, you know, God, uh, He's, he's, it's, it's his. So that's the first thing. Now I want to demonstrate this. And I, I, was, I came up with an illustration, but I got to come off the stage to do it. I want to, I'm just going to give some money out. Okay. Okay. Here's, this is a $20 bill. Here's the instructions on this. You have to find somebody that you think, it's not yours. Okay. That's the first thing. It's not yours. You have to find somebody that you, uh, that you think could be blessed with, with something. Either you give them the 20 or you can buy them a cup of coffee. You could even buy a couple, a couple people. Just somebody you think needs a touch of grace, okay? And uh, here's, here's a 10. You do the same thing, right? Instructions, not your money. Can't go buy Starbucks with that. You have to find somebody just to bless them in some way, okay? And, uh, and here's another 20 right here. Okay, you got the instructions? right? Find somebody. Don't spend it on yourself. You just got to give it away. You know, somebody you think who would be blessed by getting some money. Now, was that hard? The three of you that got the money? It's not that hard, right? Why? Because it's not your money. <laughs> I can do that. Give me more. You know, I mean, if I'd given you hundreds, I'd be, kind of the sky's the limit, right? It's easy because it's not yours. And when we recognize that it's God's and it's not mine, it changes things. It changes. We don't worry about it. We're not stressed out over it. We realize this is God's. So the first thing in, in, in being kind of this counterculture transformative thing is to recognize it's not my money. And so I need to then learn from God, God, how do you want me to use your money? I gave you instructions. So in that sense, I'm kind of like, I played God in that place where I said, okay, here's what you're supposed to do with this money. And you said, aye, aye, because it's not your money. So the minute you think it's your money, then the argument starts. God says, this is what I want you to do with your money. You go, nah, I'm not doing that. Why? Because it's mine, <laughs> right? But when we recognize it's God's money, we, we fall into place, fall into cadence. I got it. No argument, no fuzzy math. I got it. I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm headed that way. And as I said, the worry goes down because you realize you don't have to worry. You know, when you recognize that you get in your car, your car's not yours. So if you get in an accident, you go, God, your car just got totaled, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you go home and, you know, and you realize your home is not yours. So you get a leak or something. God, you got a leak. Your kids need braces. God, your kid needs, I mean, it's, it, it's not mine. See, it's not my problem. I don't have to worry about it because it's God's. Now, the first verse in this story says, the owner enlisted a manager to take care of his property. So he said, so he's saying, it's, it's his property. It's not, it wasn't the manager's. And so let me ask you a question. How are you doing at managing what God's given you? How are you taking care of your body? That was something that God gave you. How are you doing at taking care of your mind? Are you developing your mind? He gave you that. Your, your talents, the, your giftings, all those things, you, we're managers, just like this guy was. And God's saying, I want you to take care of it. Nobody at the mall right now is going around saying, well, I'm going to waste God's money in buying this piece of junk that I don't need, right? Why are they buying the piece of junk they don't need? Because they don't think it's God's money. It's mine, so I'll, I'll do what I want. But when we recognize I'm stewarding, I'm a manager, it changes. Number two, God is using money to test me. There is a test. 
God doesn't just automatically bless people. He has a test that we go through. And so one of the tests that he has is he says, here's a fundamental test, which is how we manage money. And he goes, As if, we're, if we're good with that, then he gives us true spiritual riches. That's what's going on here. He said, and, and so life is this trust. It's a test. And how we respond is God says, I want to bless you in, in the same way. Now, one of the things that we talk about, the Bible talks about is tithing, and tithing is a test. Notice it says, the purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. So there's a test. Is God first in my life? If I tithe, it demonstrates that. If I don't, it doesn't. And of course, tithe means 10%. So when I give 10%, it says, yes, God, you're first place in my life. I want you to hear a story of somebody we who came by this week, and, and, and we got a videotape of her. She's a member of our church. And she just shared real briefly about how she has learned to walk in this area of tithing that was new to her. Her name's Liz Cosmola. Watch this. Hi, I'm Liz. I've been going to Vineyard for a little over a year now. Last February, I attended the membership class where the pastor talked to us about the principle of tithing. At that point in my life, nobody had actually explained to me what tithing was, and I was not aware it was in the Bible or there was 10%. I thought every time the offering dish came around, you were just supposed to put whatever you had in the offering dish. After the membership class, I decided to go ahead and start tithing 10% every payday uh, before I paid any bills, before I grocery shopped. The first couple times was very scary and intimidating to me. It's overwhelming almost to put that amount of money aside before you've actually paid any of your bills. Um, I talked to God a lot during that time and I stuck with it and throughout the year I started to notice that instead of living the paycheck to paycheck, I was actually having extra money left over at the end of every paycheck, which had never happened before. Christmas this year, I started to consider skipping a tithe in order to buy presents for my friends and family. And I talked to God a lot about it, and in the end I decided to stick with what I was doing and, and honoring God that way. In January of this year, after a very stressful week at work and a very stressful year on a project that I'd been working on, the president of my company called me up to his office um, to tell me that he wanted to thank me for all of the work I had done the previous year and to show his gratitude, he handed me a bonus check for $1,000, which was about one week before my credit card bill was due. Um, I knew at that point that that was God working for me and letting me know that he was taking care of me and he recognized the sacrifice that I had given at Christmas time. Tithing will help to bring you closer to God and it will increase your faith in him and it will help you to do what he is asking of you as well. It has changed my life. I know it will change yours too. It's a great story, huh? Very good. Yeah, we did a, um, a survey about three months ago and we asked some different questions. One of the questions we asked was this, is I am offered, this is a question for you to answer at the survey. It says, I am offered an easy method to give to the offering using my credit or debit card. And it was their second lowest one. The, the other one was uh, prayer team ministry. But it was 64% said yes. But the other said, no, I'm not offered that. So after that, we got this easy tithe. You've been hearing about it. And easy tithe is an easy way to give if you want to give through a credit card or debit card. So I want to just walk you through this. So you can pull out your phone. If you have a smartphone, pull it out now. If you already... You know, if you're already given a different way, then just this is a time for you to play like a, a, a game. Just open your favorite app, and uh, I give you full permission, no problem at all, okay? And what I want you to do is uh, I'm going to kind of walk you through on how to do Easy Tithe, okay? So it's real simple. The first thing is, uh, let me have the next slide, is just go to your, that's for an iPhone, but go to your, if you were going to text somebody, okay? So you just open up that, that texting app, okay? And it'll have a place at the top that says two. So that's an empty block, so you'll want to put in this number. Go ahead in the next slide. Next slide. There we go. So that number is, uh, it's a local number, 757-230-2110. So you can just put that in now, okay? And uh, 
And I'm going to, if you're, if you're tithing a different way, I encourage you to at least give like maybe $5 to the food pantry or something, right? That's above and beyond your, your and uh, that way you'll know how to use this. And sometimes we will take uh, alms offerings this way and so forth. So, you know, you can be, you can be part of this. So, uh, so you put in that number and then you put in, let's say put in $5 to food pantry. Okay. And uh, so when you hit send, it'll, uh, it'll go and you'll get a response back that says, please complete this one-time registration to submit your gift. Uh, and so you click on the, the hyperlink. So, and then that will come up there, that next page. And, uh, and then you fill in your name, you know, and your address, zip code. You just put your credit card number in there. And uh, it's secure, not just through this site, but also the credit card companies on security procedures. And then, and then once it's got it in there, from then on, you'll never get that other prompt. You'll put in $5 food pantry, and it goes right there. Uh, you go $50 missions, goes right into there. And then, of course, you can tithe as well. You just put in the amount. If you just put in amount, it automatically goes to the tithe. You don't have to put in tithe. So that's how simple it is. Now, we were looking at possibly doing an app version. There's other companies that do this. We thought texting was the easiest way to do this. Very, very simple. And so during, you know, when we're giving at our offering time, you, you, some of you can just pull that out and just, you just, you know, and save it as, a, as an easy tithe. And, uh, and, and that's, that's how simple it is. Okay, so uh, now I want to look at some of the things that money tests. First of all, money shows what I love most. And no matter what we say, when we look at how, look at our calendar, how we spend our time, and we look at our credit card statements, or our, our banking statements, that is really what we love most. That's the acid test. What's most important to us is how we spend our time, how we spend our money. And so that's one of the things that, that giving does. When we love something, we give to it. We, that, we, you can't love without giving. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving because that's part of loving. Now, Matthew 6, Jesus says this, don't store up treasure here on earth. In other words, don't hoard it, don't pile it up. Instead, store your treasure in heaven. We'll talk about that in a few moments. For wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. So he says, wherever your, your treasure is. So most of you, you're not worrying about how Microsoft is doing right now unless you have stock in Microsoft, right? And that, then you're kind of, then you're watching it. Then you're more interested. But if you don't have any investment in there, you don't really care how it does. You don't, most of you don't care about how Toyota is doing because you don't have any stock in Toyota. But you, have, you start putting investments in there, then you start being interested. And so wherever our treasure is, that's, what, that's where our mind is. That's where our, our affections are. That's what we're thinking about. Number two, money shows what I really trust most. If we have faith in money for security or for happiness, that's, and, and I'm building that, and that's what I think about, it's, that that's really becomes the test. Or do I really trust that God is the one who's going to provide for me? Proverbs eleven twenty eight says, if you trust her in your money, you will fall. But if you trust in God, you will flourish like a green tree. And so that's a test of, of how important God is to me. Now, let me just say, if you don't feel that close to God, if you feel distant to him, then I suggest two things. One, spend more time serving God, serving people in Christ's name, and then also in, do something with your money that, you know, do something outside of yourself to make a difference in people's lives. And that, that starts to change our affections. Number, the third thing is, is it shows that God can trust me. So that's kind of the opposite of that. I, it shows that, God, that I'm, when I'm faithful, it shows that, that seeing unmanaged finances means that I have an unmanaged life. It's symptoms of that that, that, that things are out of control. So when we can manage our finances, it says that I'm trustworthy and that God can, 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 can trust me and to build into me. Uh, in verses 11 and 12, he says, whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little can, it will also be dishonest with much. He's talking about being irresponsible or responsible. If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, so worldly wealth, he's talking about being a good manager of your money, that you're saving and that you're, that you're, you're spending wisely, that you're investing, all those things. Uh, then he says, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with somebody else's property, who will give you property of your own? And so he says, it kind of goes back to this idea that, 
recognizing it's all God's and God has and God wants to bless me with stuff and what if the wealthiest one of the wealthiest men in the world was like your relative like somehow you're related to Warren Buffett or something and he said I when I die which is probably not too far off in the future you know when I die he goes I'm gonna I want to give you all of my wealth but he goes but first I'm gonna just give you a small portion to see if you can manage well and if you can't then really you're not the person for my wealth I'm gonna find somebody else this is kind of what's going on here and so what would happen if that was good? You'd manage it well because you know something else is coming. Well, this is life is a trust. It's a test. And God says there's greater rewards coming, spiritual rewards, eternal rewards. He goes, but I'm, I'm seeing if you're, if you're trustworthy. If, and he's using something as fundamental as money management to, to evaluate that. Now, the third truth is first, it all belongs to God. God uses money to test me. Number three is his money is a tool. Now, God uses money. It's, it's part of his purpose. That You say, well, isn't money the root of all, you know, isn't, isn't money the root of all evil? Well, the Bible says, no, the love of money is a root of all evil. It's not money. Money can be used for good or for bad. Money, some people use money to finance drugs and prostitution. Other people use money to build church buildings and, and help the poor. And there's all kinds of things that money can be. Money is neutral by itself. How we use money, that's what, makes the difference. And so the Bible says that we're to use money, but we're to love people. Sometimes people get that mixed up though. They, they, they love money and so they use people. They love money so, and they want to become wealthy and it's all about that. And so they'll, they'll use people to try to get that, that goal accomplished. But when we recognize, no, I'm only supposed to use money. I'm loving people. Then we use money to help further that end, to love people more. And there's a lot of ways to do that. You can use money to save lives to help impact people's eternities. You can uh, honor God with it. All kinds of things that you can do uh, to, uh, uh, to use your money for good. Now, this guy here in this story, he comes to the end of his rope. He's, he's fired. He he's, gets canned. He realizes, oh no, I'm in trouble. And so uh, Jesus says he did things right. Not the dishonesty part, but he says, now look at some of the things and he commends him for some of the things he did right. Here's some of those things. Number one is he looked ahead. He goes, what am I going to do now? Many people are just living for today. This guy, he's commended. Why? Because he's looking at it. He's thinking, okay, I've got to come up with a plan because I'm in this situation that I'm in. You know, this, the average savings in, for people that live in Europe is 12% of their income. The average savings for people that live in Japan is 25% of their income. The average savings for Americans is negative 1% of their income. <laughs> That's current. So they're actually getting in debt. They're spending more than they have. Now, that doesn't surprise most of you because you know, we, I mean, you live here and you, you, people are trying to always get stuff. And it's, this is a credit society. It's all about living on credit, living on, you know, it's okay to borrow and borrow and borrow as long as, you know, just live for today. But that's not what's commended about this guy. This guy, he says, you know, he's, he's thinking, he's looking ahead. He says, what am I going to do now? Proverbs 14, 8 says, the wise man looks ahead. The fool attempts to fool himself and won't face the facts. So there might be some facts that you need to face. Some of you might be in a house that is beyond your means. And the truth is, you probably need to sell it. And you're going, yeah, but that's a hassle. I'm going to lose some money. Yeah, but you'll be in such a better place afterwards. You might have a car, that the car payment is just too much. And so the truth is, you need to change th things up. You, some of you, you just need to go through Financial Peace University that we offer that like three times a year with, with Dave Ramsey. And you just need to go through and go through those steps. And that's one of the, you just, you, you're, it's out of control. How do you know when you have an out of control financial situation when you don't have a budget? Because a budget is planned spending. This is how I'm going to do it. And, and married people need a budget as much as anybody because it's all about agreeing beforehand. How is this, what's going to be the flow of the money? But you, you don't go out of control. You know, you stay within your limits. I love the fact that I drive a 14-year-old Ford. I, I paid it off like the first year. And so, you know, I don't have, I, don't, I haven't had a payment in 13 years, a car payment. I, I, I don't want to have a bunch of car payments. I don't like that plan. That's not my plan. I don't think that's God's plan for me. I want to stay within, and my, my car is just to get me from A to B. It's, it doesn't prop up my ego. I don't need a car that I can't afford. So I'm okay with that. And so some of you might need to just face the facts and say, hey, uh, you know, I don't want to fool myself. And then he also made a plan. He says, I know what I'll do. 
and he, and he, has, and he, and he thinks it through. How am I going to get there? And as I said, you know, having a budget, coming up with it. Proverbs 16, 9 says, we should make plans counting on God to direct us. So we don't do it without God's counsel, counsel but we, we make plans. And then he acted quickly. He didn't procrastinate. He didn't say someday. He didn't say one of these days I'll do it. I'll get around to it. No, he, he jumps right onto it. In verse 4, he says, I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So what he's, and, and so he's, he's making plans. He's getting, he's getting to it. Now, number four, the best use of my money is to use it to get people into heaven. It's not the only use. It is the best use. It is the best use. Now, here's a problem verse that many people don't understand in verse nine. Jesus says, I tell you, I, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves. He's talking about building relationships so that when it is gone, they will welcome you into your eternal dwelling. He's talking about heaven. Now, he's not saying that you can buy your way into heaven because you can't. You can't buy salvation. That was, that was purchased on the cross. Jesus Christ paid for our salvation. It is a free gift when we put our faith in Christ. So he's not talking about that. But what he is saying is, is that we can use our wealth we can use the, 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 our, our affluence for influence. We can use our money to help promote the gospel and people come to Christ and then they end up in eternity. Now, just imagine with me, you die, you go to, you go to heaven and then when you get there, you have like 100 people that come up and say, hey, I want to just thank you because I'm here because of you. You didn't just use your worldly wealth on your own things and just, you know, paying bills. And you, you, you were a good money manager and you helped, you helped promote the gospel with your money. I came to Christ through it. Now, that'd be pretty awesome. I'm looking forward to that. That's one of the things I want is that I want, I want I'm, I'm expected to greet people and find people in heaven that they, you know, and they're going to come up and, and I know I'm going to come up to somebody. People made sacrifices for me and I'm thankful for that. And so that's a great way. If, when you buy a Christian book and give it to somebody, when you buy them a Bible, they don't have a Bible, when, when, you, when you help people in Jesus' name it, and, you, and, you, and, they, and, they, and you're promoting the gospel and they, it's, it's all starts, some people water, some people plant seeds, God gives the growth, but the rewards are passed out because we're using our influence and money is, a, is, is an influence. N number five, one day I'll give an account to God. One day I'll give an account to God. So what, the way I use my money, the money that God's entrusted to me, because it's not mine. If I'm, if, I'm, if I'm a good steward, there will be a day of an accounting for that. And it really matters. Notice this in verse two, he says, you must now give an account of your stewardship and report what you've done with what I have entrusted to you because your time as a manager is ending. So there will be a time when your management ends. It's the day you die. There, but right now, you're managing it. But there will be a day when it's over. You're not going to live uh, in this world forever. You're going to go on and there's going to be a day of an account. And so that's why Jesus tells the story. So we don't say, hey, I didn't know. No, he'll point back to a day like this. And he'll say, no, there was a day when, and, and for some of you, this isn't the first time you heard it. But for some of you, if it is, he'll point to this day. He'll say, this is the day God said, that I said, hey, I, I expected you to be a good money manager. I expected you to at least be like that, that, that crook. But the way he was shrewd, not the way he was dishonest, but the way he was shrewd, the way he thought it through. And he said, I'm going to make plans. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recognize I don't own it all. It's God's. He's entrusted me. There's a day of an, account, uh, an accounting. I'm gonna use, the best way to use my, my, my money is to help people come to Christ. And then, you know, and get involved in it. Now, if you're not a Christ follower and you hear a message like this, it doesn't really apply to you. You just kind of listen and you think, well, you know, okay, that's, that's, that's the mission of the church. But if you're a Christ follower, if you've signed up, this is your mission. This is what God says, I want you to do. Let's bow our heads and pray, okay? Well, I want to just invite you to do a little personal like evaluation of your own life. And it begins by first saying to God, do you have, asking that, that question, have I given God first place in my life? Just ask, like in your own mind, just in, in a moment of prayer. 
God, do you really have first place in my life? Can you, just ask God, say, can you trust me? Am I managing my money well? Am I managing my opportunities well? My health well? Am I managing my life well? And then ask, say, God, how much am I investing into eternity? Will anybody be in heaven because of the way I'm using my money? I invite you to pray this. Just say, dear God, I don't want to waste the money you've entrusted to me. I don't want to waste it. I don't want to love it. I don't want to live for it. I'm certainly not going to trust it for my security. I don't want to expect it to satisfy and meet needs that only you can meet. You say, God, help me to remember from this day forward that everything belongs to you. That I don't really own anything, that it's all on loan. And after I die, it'll be loaned to somebody else. So help me to be a a good manager today. Help me to show you with my money what I love most. You say, God, help me to remember that money is just a tool. It can be used for good or for bad. So help me to do what this manager did right, to look ahead, to make a plan, to not procrastinate. You say, God, help me to remember that one day I will give an account and I want to live with each day knowing that that day is, is, is getting a little closer. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to, if you've never asked Christ into your life, would you say, God, I'll invite you into my heart. I don't understand it all, but I, I know there's something that's churning in my heart and my mind. and I want to get to know you better. I want a relationship with you. That's what God wants from you. He says, I want, I want a relationship, not a religion. I want you to know me. You say, Jesus Christ, I invite you into my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for, for, my, for the things I've done wrong, my own errant ways, my sin. Forgive me for that, Lord. Bring me new life and put the hope of the resurrection in my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have uh, our prayer teams that are gonna come up. If you'd like to receive prayer, some of you might be in here just in, you you know, something's going on this week and you need prayer for that and we'd love to pray for you, okay? You can stand with me and I'll dismiss us in, in just, a, a, just, a, uh, just a prayer of blessing, I guess, huh? Okay? Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word and how it can transform us. Help us, Lord, to, to be transformed. And Lord, we just pray that as we encountered uh, your word that we don't forget it, that it just resonates in our life. Help it to transform our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you. Thanks for coming tonight.